location. And we were very interested in having, you know, putting a lot of art galleries together to see what can happen. It's been a very interesting experience being here in West Hollywood. Being stationed at the Pacific Design Center certainly offers us access to a different demographic than typically might go to a contemporary fair in Los Angeles. The recipe is that we want the fair very manageable and accessible, only 55 art galleries with all the extra publications and publishers. There's a lot more exhibitors, but we have half Los Angeles galleries and half international galleries. I love the fact that it's not just art galleries. There's so many other things going on. On top of lectures, on top of book signings, Mark Ryden is signing books mm -hmm. right now. And then there's vintage zines from San Francisco, yes. and I just love that. And then there's like yeah. playing video games, and there's like records and yeah. DJs. Yeah. And Wendy Gao from Uga Booga, I've been a big fan of what she does with her shop in Chinatown, and we essentially turned over an entire showroom to Wendy. And so that, that is sort of the, you know, the Wendy Gao Uga Booga book party room, uh, <laughs> which is a great resting spot for the fair, that it's a whole different environment in there than booth to booth to booth. Yeah, I just wanted to have like a variety of people that are doing like interesting things in the independent publishing and hope to show different facets of that room. And there's a lot of people from Los Angeles, but we also have some people from Chicago and Portland and London and San Francisco. And plus, I love that there's affordable stuff. So even if you can't buy one of the original paintings that you love in the other room, you can come over here and support art and buy something wonderful and handmade, but it's not $10 million. A couple years ago, friends of mine had mentioned casually that they were throwing away their zines, which to me felt sort of wrong. Why would you throw away zines? Zines are a very important influence on a lot of creative people, something that helped us find information about all kinds of alternative opinions and information and art before we had the internet. So zines are a really important part of our history. So when people would start to throw them away, I would offer to take them off their hands. I didn't know what I would do with them someday. I certainly didn't see myself here with people's zine collections, but that's exactly where we are. There's about a thousand zines here. People are allowed to actually pick up and read anything they would like. Zine culture goes back many, many, many decades, and it's such a, a rabbit hole of little areas you can discover and explore. And that's something that I hope to be able to do, is to give zines another chance to be seen, to be understood, to be reinterpreted today, particularly in the wake of this idea that print is dead. pages from my old encyclopedias or lexicons, Greek, French, English, German. He lays them on canvas and then he starts uh, this very elaborate ink drawing. He gets inspired either by the illustrations on the text or by single words or even by the geometry that the words and the letters create on canvas. Then the whole drawing, you know, explodes. <laughs> We premiered the new body of work by Gina Ostello, who is an artist based in Los Angeles. Gina constructs these large-scale installations and rooms that she then photographs. In this case, they're made out of paper and cardboard and spray paint, and then photographs it and then destroys the actual installation. I'm very happy to have 
had the chance to show her new work here. I'm seeing lots of great people, collectors, curators, writers, artists, and uh, I've been very happy each day I'm doing a solo show of one artist. Today I'm showing Bart Exposito, a new painting and two works on paper. Tomorrow I'm showing Kristen Cunningham, a sculptor I've been working with. We're going to show a new body of work of wall shelf pieces. They're sort of a cross between painting and sculpture. As I was cruising around the fair, uh, this painting has been on my mind. I find it completely intriguing and beautiful, and every single time I look at it, there's something different that I see. This is Tom LaDuke, a Los Angeles artist. The painting, called Lovelorn, in its essence, the underpainting is a painting of the television screen in his studio. So within that context of the television screen, there are two layers of visual information. One is a still from the film he's watching. In this case, it's the movie Elizabeth with Kate Blanchett. And then still within that context of the television screen, if we were in Tom's studio, all the things that would be behind us, the work tools, the paintings, the paints, reflected on the glass of the television screen, just like it does on the TV in your house that your brain tries to filter it out so you can watch the film you're watching. Then this abstraction on the surface is actually fragments from an old master painting. It's Van Eyck's The Arnold Feeney Portrait, which is also known as The Marriage Portrait. This is actually the chandelier in the painting. This is the dog in the painting. This is the fold of the man's coat in the painting. And so there's no photography involved in this. This is strictly paint on canvas. That's correct. There is photographic source imagery. He'll photograph his TV screen. So he'll study the photographs, the photo of the film he's watching, the photo of the reflection on the television screen. So he's looking at photos, but he's making a painting. about the economy overall in the art market now? Oh, definitely on the upswing. Things have turned around since Miami and since this beginning of the year. I think the last three months and the last quarter actually has been really strong in terms of sales for us. And things are back on track and everything is working out perfectly for us. It's hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's really hard. But the, I mean, our saving grace is that we have really low overhead and we, we're not like a very you know, expensive or large business and we don't spend a lot of it. We're very, we're very frugal. We, we do most things by ourselves when we can. So that's kind of saves us, but it's also been really difficult because, um, you know, maybe for some people like art books are a luxury that they cut down on during tough times, but, you know, it's also a good way to support, you know, like artists in a small way, like sometimes, you know, when we have a little check for them, they're like, oh, I just really needed it right now. So it's also good, even though it's not, you know, as large of a sum as what the galleries are making. Publish little books that you can read in the time it takes to drink a cup of coffee. They're all 16 to 32 pages, fabulous essays, short stories, poetry, for example, is the greatest essay ever written on Liberace by Dave Hickey with a fabulous center full. Baudelaire poetry, both classic and contemporary things. LA artists like Jeffrey Valance's Life with Dick, 
which is a hilarious escapade of him with Richard Nixon. Valerie Solanas' scum manifesto, of course, the woman who shot Andy Warhol. You have the Constitution of the United States, which everyone should read if they haven't. Guns and guns on the cover, of course, church and state. <laughs> The economy certainly has played a big effect in how we do things. If we had launched our application back in June, many of the galleries may have looked the other way. We launched it 1st of September, and people were very responsive to that idea. Are you interested in doing a project here in West Hollywood? Are you interested in looking at the January time slot, being a part of LA Arts Month? And so through those conversations, we started speaking to international galleries and such, and our friends in Miami and New York, and great galleries showed certain interest.